Hello everyone, welcome to this Convergence Science Network event. I'm Luan Ismahil, the Executive Director and your host. On behalf of our sponsors, I'd like to thank you for being a part of our very first online presentation. Let's welcome Professor Borland to deliver his presentation, Why is Planning to Prevent Undesirable Futures So Difficult? Over to you, Ron. Thanks very much, Luan, for those kind words. Uh, I've come to this presentation from a career of over 30 years in behavioural science applied to public health, particularly understanding and developing better interventions to help people uh, act in healthier ways. Much of my focus in that time has been on smoking cessation, and in many points I've, I've counterpoised it with uh, experiences and looking over the fence into the experiences of others dealing with other health preventive behaviours. Studying diverse behaviours has revealed different challenges as well as many commonalities among the various behaviours. For example, we've become quite good at getting people to try to change some unhealthy behaviours, but have become, uh, but still uh, in the rudimentary stages of actually helping people maintain healthy behaviours in the long term. For example, the average smoker has failed to quit dozens of times. These observations have made it clear to me that the, the theoretical models I started out with, which were essentially based around the notion of humans as rational actors, were flawed in many respects. So largely as a result of those limitations, I've worked to develop a more comprehensive approach and to try and build in modern understanding of the limits of human behaviour and human thinking into a more comprehensive way of thinking about the challenges of behaviour change. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. In doing so, I'm talking as somebody who's used theory to, in an applied way, and much of the work that I'm going to talk about comes from others, not from my own, uh, own laboratory or research. So in what I'm doing, uh, I want to take a broad systems approach to look at the complexity of things and uh, necessarily that involves a, a heap of theoretical uh, work before we can get down to more of the nitty gritty. What I want to focus on here are things that we want to avoid or make less harmful than they might otherwise be. My work is focused, as I said, on individual risks, but I also want to talk about how that those insights might apply to societal risks but from those localised communities like bushfires uh, to humanity as a whole, such as we're facing with the COVID uh, issue. And in doing that, it's important to understand constraints on human reasoning and decision making, and thus in what we want. I'll be talking about the role of affect, which is a broader term than emotion because it includes some aspects of our tendencies to behave that are not necessarily conscious, as well as our feelings. The importance of experienced uncertainty, often experienced as anxiety, and the limits of our rationality so what are some of the core limitations of human thinking? First of all, we're limited capacity processes. What we consider is constrained by the context and expectations. Our initial processing of that information is evaluative. That is, we know whether we like or dislike something before we actually know what it is. Because things are complicated, we use a variety of heuristics or shortcuts, which can be extremely helpful in our thinking, but which can create systematic biases. These constraints all mean that we can feel about, the way we feel about things can be different to the way we think about them. And trying to come up with an understanding of that divergence between how we think and how we feel has led to the emergence of a range of dual process theories of which the one I've developed is one. Essentially, the simple models of behaviour are that the person in a context or environment, and it's the interaction of the two that leads to their behaviour and in 
including behaviour change. The addition of dual process uh, models is to suggest that there are two interacting systems within the individual. One I call the executive system, which directs things and is based around stories, and another, the operational system, which is our habits, our capacities and skills. It's the things we do without having to think about them. There are various other terms for these. Uh, the executive system, sometimes called the reflective system, in the work of uh, the Nobel laureate uh, Daniel Kahneman, it's, he calls it system two. His uh, thinking, other people describe it as the conscious thinking, but it is not simply conscious thinking. Some aspects of our operational activity can be conscious, but they don't need to be. The operational system is also variously described as impulsive system one, and much of its activity is unconscious. The way dual process theories are conceived to operate is that executive processes allow us to develop stories, which include theories and scientific theories about the world that can anticipate future possibilities and or draw on past experiences to guide us in the way in which we act. Stories can either help us understand the world or justify how we feel about the world. Those that simply justify how we feel about the world don't take us generally in any useful direction, but they make us feel good. What we need are stories that help us to understand the world and act better in it. Explanatory stories can act as a set of forces for action that then compete with the operational processes of what we feel we want to do at the moment to influence our behaviour. In some sense, as they like, a completely different environment that we're responding to, the environment of the story as compared with the environment of reality. At least in my model of dual processing, the executive only acts through the operational system. That is, we need to make ourselves feel like doing what we rationally think we should do if we're going to do it. Because if we don't feel like doing the things that are in our best interests rationally, we will never have the motivation to actually make those changes. So just thinking something is a good idea is not enough. We have to come to feel that this is really important for us to do. One of the key things about having two uh, interactive systems is that sometimes the systems are in uh, opposition to each other. And we can see this from, the, from this diagram. If we look at the top left-hand corner, we have a situation where our operational system, that is what we want to do, is saying, hey, this is fun. I really want to do this, but our executive system is saying, not a good idea. Something like smoking uh, for a smoker. Smokers enjoy smoking uh, and they feel good about it at the time that they do it, but they also know that it's going to harm them in the long term. But even though they know it's going to harm them, it's difficult for them to eliminate or reduce that behaviour. In the bottom right-hand corner are the other kind of hard-to-maintain behaviours. These are ones that are hard to acquire or sustain. These are things we know we should do, like getting up early in the morning to, uh, for our exercise, but our operational system says, oh, I can't be bothered. I just really don't feel like that at the moment. So we actually have to put in effort to overcome that inertia that our operational system uh, places before us. It is these two kinds of behaviours that uh, behaviour change scientists tend to focus on. Much of the rest are things that we just do or we just don't do because the two systems are in concord or where there's some mild uh, degree of discord. Uh, there's really things that we can choose to do and we can make change our behaviour without too much in the way of trouble. Turning now to a point I alluded to earlier about the primacy of evaluation and this starts with a, wor uh, 
uh, the work of Bob Zions and his associates uh, that uh, uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. The first thing, the first judgment we make about a stimulus is evaluative. So whether it's good or bad, a threat or an opportunity, or whether to approach or avoid it. And that happens well before whatever we're looking at or hearing is represented in consciousness. So we know it's good or bad before we know what it is. This has profound implications for the way in which we think about the world, implications that I don't think psychology has even yet managed to come fully to terms with. Because we think with our executive systems, we like to think our executive systems have it all under control and this is an uncomfortable reality that we just don't quite know how to deal with, but it's one that it's important to deal with. One of the other things about evaluation is that avoidance gradients are steeper than approach ones, which is important for preventing too much concern. I can vividly remember uh, on safari in Africa watching as a lion started to uh, approach a herd of uh, antelope. In the early stages, the antelope were not the least bit concerned. They just continued doing what they were doing, although clearly they seemed to have been aware that the lion was there because once it got to a particular point close enough, suddenly they began to take action. They alerted themselves and then uh, moved away as it became closer. They didn't need to worry when, a, when a, a threat is far away, but the lion needed to begin approaching uh, because it was something it wanted to get to. So that is a reflection of that uh, difference between the two. Opportunities direct us towards specific actions and they may be well in the distance. Threats have multiple potential solutions. They motivate us to search for solutions, but they don't direct us towards any particular one. So we've got to do something, what are we going to do? And the actions we take seem to be proportionate to the experience concern, not necessarily to the actuarial cost. And that's even the case where people are aware of what the actuarial cost, they know that this is a not so important, but they will still respond as if it was important where their experience is of anxiety or fear. Another important point that we now know to be the case is that novelty is initially mildly threatening. So you have a mild avoid reaction to a novel stimulus. And this probably makes good evolutionary sense. New things, we don't know whether they're going to be good for us or bad for us, and the wise move is to initially treat them with some caution. So we tend to do that, and those initial uh, responses will dissipate with time and can turn around if the novel uh, object or person or whatever it, uh, comes to be seen as being uh, a valued uh, acquisition to their environment and thus does, uh, to approach them in future rather than continuing to avoid them. One of the things about the way we respond to threat though is that avoiding it is often our strongest ten tendency, either psychologically or physically. We generally prefer not to confront threats where we can avoid them and we certainly don't want to succumb to them. And for psychological threats, we can deny the risk altogether or minimise its magnitude. We create stories of personal immunity. Couldn't happen to us. I'm the sort of person who, uh, uh, who but this is not an issue. I'm a really good driver, therefore I can drive above the speed limit or whatever. And when there's uncertainty, as there typically is in the sorts of situations we're talking about, it's much easier to avoid or to delay to see what happens. I don't need to worry about it now, we'll see what happens in the future. And people are also concerned, at least in some cultures, about the consequences of false alarms. We don't want to be seen to be overly alarmist. 
All of these things tend to act to minimise our responses to threat. The first signs of a problem are usually ambiguous. And while people vary in their threat threshold, which is a good thing, we need some people who are more sensitive, who are more likely to give us the early warning than others who are less sensitive and can go on for some time. Uh, but uh, So that means that we often need a critical mass of concern before we mobilise around social events. Next, I want to talk about the importance of framing. Framing is an idea that was introduced into the social sciences by uh, the anthropologist Gregory Bateson back uh, in the in ancient times, uh, and it's really about what we take into consideration in shaping our thinking, and what we see is an edited version of what's available to our senses. So. What we think when we look around, we're seeing everything. Typically, we're not. We're only processing a small percentage of that and filling in the gaps. There are some very good demonstrations of that in the, in the psychological literature. Uh, it's a very strong effect. And what we think about is a very limited set of what we perceive because we are very limited. Uh, uh, processes, our capacity to take into account more than half a dozen different ideas at once is extremely limited and even for that only the, the more intellectually adroit are able to do that. Taken with us, people can have very different uh, perspectives on the same problem, especially when they approach it from different points of view or with different values. And this has been known since ancient times and is best typified by the parable of the blind men and the elephant, which many of you will be aware. Essentially, if you only look at a part, you may not get to have a complete or adequate understanding of what the whole looks like because some of the parts are very different. The whole can look very different to its parts. Perspectives also change within individuals from the shifting values and priorities. The way in which we perceive an issue, a, a, a problem can be affected by the extent to which we believe that we're personally responsible for actions, in that we take more personal responsibility for actions than for failing to act. Thus, we tend to have the inertia of people not wanting to take action in case it's wrong and they get blamed, but think if they don't take action, they'll get away with it. And this is a fairly common human tendency, which we will all have experienced to some degree in our lives. We also expect other, others to protect us more than we expect to protect ourselves, or we expect to be protected from ourselves. Thus, the amount of resources that we're prepared to allow the society to spend to protect us from something like terrorists is orders of magnitude, thousands of times greater than the amount of resources we put into protecting us from issues like the one I've spent much of my life studying, smoking cessation. Generally, a, a year of life for, for preventing smoking is costed out at about somewhere around $100, whereas a year of life to prevent terrorism is in the millions of dollars. These are not equivalent, yet we see them as rational. So people are prepared to accept, what people are prepared to accept can differ markedly from what we see as rational. Unfortunately, as we've come to understand these limits of cognition, they're often being exploited, not compensated for, in the ways in which we operate. Modern advertising has taken to these things with its use of truth propositions. That is, as long as something you say is true, you can mislead people uh, uh, with, with everything else. And spin doctors of various kinds do that in the more general uh, sphere. So 
people have become very good at exploiting these uh, limitations in our, our way of thinking by getting people to look narrowly at an issue and ignore other important aspects. And people tend to do that because comprehensive thinking is hard to do and even and while it's hard to do, it's also even harder probably to communicate to others the complexity, as some of you may be experiencing listening to the complexity in which I'm talking about at the moment. So we often rely on shortcuts, which in psychological jargon are known as heuristics. And uh, some people see heuristics as a form of laziness, intellectual laziness, but if we tried to analyse everything we did in life, uh, we would never do anything we'd spend all our time analysing. So it's not laziness unless perhaps you are the expert, in which case you do need to have looked at things thoroughly. So some of the shortcuts we take are taking the expert's word for it. If a doctor in a white coat tells you that you have a disease of a particular kind, you're likely to believe them. Also, we tend to accept things that fit in with our existing understanding. And this is both something that's psychologically rewarding, but it also can lead to major biases in the way in which we think. We are less critical of information that is consistent with current beliefs and understanding. And there are some brilliant examples of it in, uh, in the book by Nisbet and Ross, which was published 40 years ago, that we can't claim that this is new knowledge. I think the basis of these is that what is most affectively engaging to the person tends to dominate their thinking and it tends to distort their thinking around what we feel is important rather than necessarily what we think is important. And now I'd like to turn a little bit to attitudes. Generally, psychologists identify two kinds of attitudes, implicit and explicit attitudes. Explicit attitudes are what people consciously believe about things, relationships, whatever. They're often assessed by self-report, but we need to control for what people think we want to hear. There is some social desirability sometimes in the way in which people present their explicit attitudes. But they're evaluated by people in terms of how they, well they fit into our self stories. That's the stories we tell about ourselves and our sense of where, who we are in the world and what we want to be and do. Implicit attitudes, however, are how we feel. They may be unconscious, but not necessarily so. When they're at least partly conscious and where they're inconsistent with the explicit attitude, they're experienced as, I shouldn't feel that way. Implicit attitudes can be measured by a range of things, uh, like the speed of people's reactions to when you link a, uh, a, an attitudinal object to something that's positive. Uh, if your reactions to it are quicker than when you link it to something that's negative, it suggests that you have a positive attitude to that uh, particular uh, behaviour or thing, and vice versa. Both kinds of attitudes can change, but the mechanisms of change are quite different. Explicit attitudes tend to be changed via argument and analysis, and through changing the stories we tell ourselves. Implicit attitudes change more as a result of our experiences. But the two have both have predictive relationships to related beliefs and behaviours, but they, they are different. They can end up being uncorrelated with each other. So what you say and how you feel need not be in concord, as I've uh, demonstrated earlier. I think it's useful to think about explicit attitudes as being aspirational, particularly when they conflict with implicit attitudes. So this is the sort of person I would like to be and I'm trying to be, and by adopting these implicit, explicit attitudes and by trying to live the story that 
encompasses them, we can create the situation where uh, we change our implicit attitudes because we have positive associations associated with something that we may have initially felt uncomfortable about. So what are the implications of all this for preventive behaviours? Well, first of all, there are strong psychological forces encouraging avoidance and or delay. We need to understand that planning is more under executive control and it is based primarily on our expectations. Pre-planning should be general and not make too many assumptions about what will actually happen. Some of the work I've done recently in the area of smoking indicates that people who do too much pre-planning before they make a quit attempt may in fact be less successful in their attempt than people who leave much of the planning until after they've quit when they're actually planning around the actual experiences and challenges that they face. The problem with too much pre-planning is that you're often planning for things that don't actually happen. By contrast, the maintenance of change is more a function of our experiences. Success is partly a function of the extent to which our habit strength changes for the relevant behaviours. The alternative behaviours, the desirable ones become stronger and the less desirable ones are decline in strength. This takes time. And it's also a function of the extent to which other priorities do not demand the resources that we need to maintain the change until the habit strength uh, has changed sufficiently for them to be self-maintaining. We live complicated lives, we're not just doing one thing and we have limited resources in which to act. Also, it's important to understand that failure can lead to irrational beliefs which are generally thought to occur to reduce experience dissonance. People don't like feeling that they're do doing something that they shouldn't, so they often create irrational beliefs. I'm the sort of person who, who, who won't get cancer so I can continue to smoke. Uh, lots of uh, doctors smoke so it can't be all that harmful. Those kinds of beliefs which uh, uh, are often not deeply held beliefs, but are uh, comforting beliefs that make people feel better about their situation. This leads me to one of the big challenges in prevention, sometimes called the paradox of prevention. Everybody agrees prevention is desirable, but absent a real threat of imminent risk, it's hard to get effectively engaged with. It's not as important as heroic medicine, for example. And further, when we're successful in preventing something, nothing happens. So the value of our preparations can be questioned. Why did you put all that time and effort or resources into, into, into that? Nothing's happened. You needn't have done anything. Prevention tends to work best when, the, when evidence is salient on the perils of failing to prevent, either because there's been a recent event where something hasn't been prevented or because uh, there are enough uh, events around in other places where there's been a failure to prevent, so you know that things will happen. So for road accidents, uh, preventive strategies are clearly accepted by the community because we, we know we're, we're not 100% successful and uh, we know we're reducing the levels of road accidents because we have the statistics to tell us. But even there, we tend to ignore the statistics over time and it's the uh, the occurrence of near misses and uh, emotionally salient events that I think are, are, are driving our agreement as a society to continue to persist in these ways. The other, th uh, the other thing is that preventing probabilistic outcomes always requires a belief in the initially unobservable shift in the risk. So preventing for a future, unless that future is certain, requires a belief. And that belief needs to be based on some kind of a story. So if we have the wrong stories, we're not going to have the right beliefs. And as I said, inevitably there's a decline in concern as time from the last salient event increases. 
or distance from the last salient event increases. If it's happened somewhere else in the world, it's nowhere near as salient as if, as if it happens to us. The other big challenge in planning for prevention is the wisdom of hindsight. And I put wisdom in, brack, in uh, inverted commas for a very good reason. Because after an event, we know what has happened. Before an event, we can only guess. When reflecting on what has happened, we cannot ignore things we now know that were unknowable at the time when the initial action would have been optimal. As much as we may try to do this, we can't fully do it, particularly those aspects of the, uh, of the effects that are unconscious, that we haven't explicitly linked to our thinking about the issue. So it's not only impossible to be sure that we haven't compensated, but to, we can't be sure as to the extent to which any compensation we have attempted to make has been adequate or not. The early signs of any kind of difficult to manage event are inevitably ambiguous whether it be signs of an illness or at an individual level, or of an illness that might be contagious enough to create an epidemic. So we have this uncertainty, and often our solutions that we come up with the wisdom of hindsight imply that we have knowledge that we could not have had at the time that we were needed to make the initial decisions. And thus some of the recommendations we get, and certainly some of the commentary we get around uh, our successes and particularly our failures is that they now know things that we didn't know at the time and therefore blame us for not knowing things that we couldn't know. So what might the implications of all this be for, for preventing and managing unwanted events that are of a more social nature? There are many kinds of disasters. They range from those that affect localised communities like fires and floods and hurricanes uh, uh, through to ones that might affect large areas like war, uh, through to diseases uh, which can be localised or which can be a threat to, to pretty much the entire community like uh, COVID-19. Hard to change behaviours both and disaster planning both involve accepting short-term pain uh, for the prospect of long-term gain. Both require trust in the prevention story. The failure to act often leads to regret or recriminations, and acting successfully may not produce any tangible benefits at all because something's not happened, and that's not tangible. And thinking about the problem is inherently anxiety provoking, which generates the societal tendency to either confront or avoid, particularly to avoid. There are a lot of things about disasters that we know that I don't want to go into in detail here. There are lots of potential threats and great uncertainty as to when and where they'll happen and how big they are and whatever. We know that preparation can be extraordinarily costly. So we need to take that into account. What we prepare for is likely to be different in, in important ways to what happens also, a point I've already made. And we need to make sure that we don't over plan for events before we know exactly what's going to happen or what the, the parameters of the risk are. And we need to be continually aware of the prevention paradox uh, that the further we are from events, effective preparation will be readily written off as needless waste until the next event occurs. But in general, with all of this complexity and the resources involved, how can we be prepared for all of these kinds of contingencies and continue to live sensible lives? If we think too much about them, we'll go drive ourselves crazy. So what are some of the extra challenges for disaster planning? Behaviour change focuses on the individual. It's about the sacrifice of the short term 
uh, uh, health and psychological well-being for the longer term benefit, a probabilistic benefit, whereas disasters involve the entire community. In addition to physical and psychological health, but for social events we need to consider the economic well-being of the society and importantly and often neglected, we need to consider issues around social cohesion. Social cohesion is really important and there is real risk that the more disadvantaged in the society will differentially cop the uh, a disproportionate share of the harms and be slower to be able to recover because they have less resources to do so. It's differentially hard to predict the magnitude of consequences across these events, particularly in relation to the economic well-being as compared with uh, physical health. Physical health in terms of death tends to occur very quickly in many of these events, so we can document it quite rapidly. Some of the economic costs may go on for years and some of the social cohesion effects may affect us for years as well. So it's very difficult to accurately balance the interests, particularly when one needs to be uh, set off against the other. And a, an important point I would make, that social cohesion does not need to be set off one against the other. It can be an opportunity to increase social cohesion. And the reason for that is we become more socially oriented under external threat, facilitates coordinated mass action. The remarkable, seemingly remarkable uh, achievement of getting virtually everybody in many countries of the world to basically remain housebound uh, for a period of weeks uh, is uh, to socially distance. And people have, for the most part, uh, complied with these strategies. But one of the things about mass action is that responses vary different, uh, are very different to in-groups and out-groups. There is a strong tendency for an us versus them to emerge. And this is partly as a result of reduced tolerance of dissent and to those who are not obviously part of the us that are facing this dilemma. And we need to be very cautious that we don't exacerbate those things. If you compare the response of uh, the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinta Ardern, who has actually used disasters as a way of trying to bring groups closer together, with we're all of the, in this together and we have to be treated as one, as compared with some of the reactions among other world leaders, one can see immediately that these events can actually help facilitate uh, increased social cohesion or can be used to tear us apart. The other point I want to make here is that once the threat is seen to pass or we've had enough of it, uh, people tend to make a rapid reassessment in terms of their own personal needs and that people want to return to their normal lives. So the mass uh, coordinated action tends to have a limited time span and unless we achieve things during that time span it becomes more and more difficult uh, to get people to engage in socially responsible actions that counter their own personal needs as, as time goes on. So I just threw this in just to remind people that we've actually been extremely good at uh, some forms of preparedness from building standards, fire restrictions, curtailing the spread of infectious diseases, immunisation, infection control procedures, although some of those may be breaking down and actually eliminating some, uh, some diseases from uh, the world. And what we've learned from these past uh, problems has made us better prepared for future ones. So in summary, there are key limitations of human reasoning that we need to understand. We can only understand we can only consider a limited number of ideas at any one time. And if we're going to consider the complexity of ideas, we need some kind of quasi-hierarchical organisation into key summaries to use in subsequent thinking and decision making. We need to understand that our thinking begins with evaluative judgments, not with objective appraisal. 
that everything we do has an evaluative, evaluative aspect to it and we need to treat that as a potential strength, not as a limitation. And that goes to our ability to act. Rationality is a tool that we can use to temper our intuitions, but when it's used to rationalise what we want rather than to analyse what we need, it may be doing us a grave disservice. So in conclusion, we can always do better at prevention. We do learn from our experiences. However, I think we're doing better than we're often given credit for. Distortions due to knowledge of hindsight can lead to unattainable strategies or ambitions. We need to recognise that preparedness has costs and sometimes these can be uh, greater than the costs of waiting for the problem to emerge. And that we can only sustain heightened alertness around negative issues for a limited time, otherwise we would go psychologically mad. The myths and values we live by are constantly changing as well. And we're constrained by the ones we believe in today and they're not necessarily the ones we will believe in tomorrow and they're not necessarily exactly the same ones that people share in other countries. This means that we sometimes need to compromise on what we want to do if we're going to act in a global way rather than in a more local way and in an increasingly inter interdependent world it's increasingly important that we act glo globally and the social cohesion that's required for that is an important social uh, uh, resource. Sorry. All these points that what we get wrong is more notable or obvious than what we get right. We get blamed for being wrong and we are rarely praised for getting it right. But we need to remember on the good side that we're better prepared for, ra for rapid response than any previous time in human histories. This is important because we are now, as an in, as increasingly interdependent world, uh, we're getting more issues that, that need to be attacked at a global level. Getting the balance right between what is rationally best and what humans want is an ongoing challenge. Understanding the limits of human capacities and the impact of varying human desires and values and getting the right balance between what is rationally going to be in our best interests and what meets our more immediate psychological needs is going to be an ongoing challenge that will face us well into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for that presentation that really tackles an issue that I think uh, hasn't got a lot of attention. Clearly, it's uh, you've done a lot of work and um, you've shared with us um, a lot of your thoughts and experience. And uh, I'm just wondering, an issue that you didn't mention, it's, it's come up in the conversations about the COVID, uh, in the COVID uh, experience, um, the issue of trust. Uh, you know, it's a question of trusting government authorities. Um, people do believe uh, in government. Uh, um, we have a tendency to believe government instructions that, you know, it's all under control. Um, what role, how do you sort of explain, you know, the role of trust? How does that factor in in our behaviour? It's obviously uh, something that we take into account or, or we don't. Yes, uh, it actually got trimmed out of the longer version that, uh, uh, and uh, replaced with uh, the, the focus on, uh, on social cohesion. And social cohesion and trust are very closely related notions. Unless you believe that, the, uh, that those who govern us are governing us in our best interests and are able to protect us in effective ways, we're not going to uh, respond positively to what they ask us to do. So trust is critical and trust is a limited resource and many politicians uh, uh, 
give up some of the trust we have in them by acting in ways that are, are less less than ideal. But the history of democracies is that that trust has been built up over generations, and we have a have confidence that it will remain, and uh, it is sustainable. It's why in countries where, where you try and impose democracy on a on a country, uh, there isn't the trust there. There isn't the the belief in that the leaders are there to protect us and they have the ability to protect us. So it's not just trust in their good intentions, but it's also trust that they can do more to protect us than we could do otherwise. We have a, a couple of questions uh, from the audience I'd like to put to you. One is from John Bates, and I'll read this out if you don't mind. Uh, John says, I'm interested in the apparent conflict in your thinking, re the need for pre-planning in some contexts. Smoking as an example, uh, this could work okay. In other settings, for example, bushfire and cyclone, the lack of pre-planning can be catastrophic. The aim of both is prevention of adverse outcomes. That's a comment. It, do you have a, have yes, a comment? Yes, I, I do have a comment on that. I, I think it's an important point. Uh, the point I was trying to make, and I clearly didn't uh, get it across uh, as clearly as I could have, is that it's the kind of pre-planning you do. So if you're pre-planning for bushfires, you don't assume that they're going to happen in Gippsland and uh, deploy all your resources down in Gippsland because that's the place where they're most likely to happen, only to just, just discover that uh, they break out in New South Wales or in Queensland, uh, to take Australian examples. So we need to be prepared, we need to have the resort, make sure we have the resources available that we think we'll need and to have them to be able to be deployed where they're needed rapidly. And that's in a sense I think what most of the, of the bushfire uh, uh, planning strategies are about, is about having that flexible kind of workforce, the relationships between uh, fire services in various states and countries to be able to share resources uh, are strategies in place to be able to rapidly deploy the resources we need where they're needed. And then when you're on the ground, actually dealing with the contingencies of on the ground, you need to be responding to what's actually happening on the ground rather than having some pre-planned approach that you're going to do X or Y. Thank you, Ron. Um, Alexis has a question. Is there the potential to develop a metric to assess those in an organisation who are psychologically more suited to future disaster planning and management? Uh, that's uh, getting beyond my area of competence, I, uh, I have to say. So what I say is very, very speculative. Uh, yes, people who have good uh, cognitive rational skills are, tend to be good at planning. Uh, you see very good examples of planning in the military. Um, people in government within these kinds of think tanks are generally very good at, the pl at planning. Uh, often they plan in ways that are rationally, given the assumptions they make, plausible and well-developed. But what I think they often fail to do is to consider the limitations of the of the inputs of the facts that on which they base their planning, if you like, or the assumptions on which they base their planning. And also I think there's a tendency to underestimate the importance of the way in which people will respond uh, when these crises occur. So the way in which we think we're going to deal with a crisis, absent the crisis, is often quite different to the way in which we actually respond when the crisis actually hits us. Uh, and the good thing about that is generally most people are very good when a crisis comes. We've, it brings out the best in people, as people often say. And it's true. Thank you, Ron. Abby Robinson has a question. How can we prevent crisis fatigue without reducing the importance of the issue? For example, climate change. I wish I had the answer to that. <laughs> uh, I, part of the way in which we do it is by institutionalising our responses so we don't need to think about the things that we over which we have limited control. 
And unfortunately, uh, in the area of climate change, it's become a contested issue. So we seem to be fighting for things over which we have very limited control because they need to be done at a much broader societal level, which people find incredibly frustrating and, uh, uh, and demotivating. Uh, where there is a societal consensus of the need to act, um, these things are put in place and they've become part of normal day-to-day -day life. The, we all accept uh, the restrictions on, on what we do on the roads for road safety. Uh, building codes are all in there and people are happy with them. They're not thinking about their, their buildings falling down because they're, they're reassured that all of these structures in the society are actually working to, uh, to protect them. The challenge for the environment is that there are going to be some losers as well as some winners in the short term with the environment and the people who see themselves losing in the short term have a vested interest in being less concerned than the people who see themselves as winners. One of the good examples of that is the uh, Montreal Protocol on uh, CFCs, which was uh, passed virtually before the, the, the ink was dry on the science. And in that case, the, the reason that the world was able to act so quickly was that the companies that uh, manufactured most of the CFCs also had the patents for the replacement products. So they're on a win-win situation by uh, accepting the change because they could just move and produce other products. So they didn't stand to lose, so they didn't compete. As the big uh, energy companies are transforming themselves to be able to provide the energy needs of the future in uh, more sustainable ways, we're finding some of the opposition from at least some of those companies is beginning to dissipate. So looking at where the, uh, where the incentives are, I think, is always an important way of understanding why we're not getting these sorts of changes. But uh, that's uh, going a bit off uh, the, uh, the actual question. An anonymous question for you, Ron. The Prime Minister has used evidence-based rational thinking in terms of COVID response, but appears to refuse to act rationally in terms of climate change. I don't think this is a trust issue. Uh, what is your opinion? I, I think it is. I, I, I'm not sure why uh, the lack of consistency on the part of our Prime Minister across these two issues uh, relates to trust. I think uh, the, the response of the Australian government uh, to the COVID crisis has been extremely good and uh, we're, we're, we're seeing the benefits of that and it can be counterpoised with uh, uh, the Prime Minister's uh, a poor response to the, the bushfires, particularly the early stages of the bushfires where the government response was the one of avoidance and trying to pretend it didn't happen. I think many people are still in that stage with regard to, to climate change. They're wanting to pretend it doesn't happen. Uh, if that continues and we don't get the sorts of changes that many people expect, then those sections of the community are going to increasingly lose trust in the ability of government to make the kinds of changes that we need to make. But that's, trust isn't something that typically is completely lost, at least for institutions overnight. It can be lost for an individual very quickly, but not for institutions. So I think we still, holding out considerable hope that our institutions will rise to the occasion. And if we look in the rest of the world, many governments around the world, including uh, governments that are at least as conservative as the Australian government, are taking strong action on climate change. So it really isn't a political issue, left-right political issue anyhow. And how it's happened here is uh, a topic for another discussion, I guess. Uh, another question from John Bates. How does the human trait of optimism, I'm invincible uh, that it will happen to someone else but not me, uh, fit into preparing for and avoiding adverse outcomes? It, it, it's an important factor in it. If we didn't have some degree of optimism, we wouldn't take any risks in our lives. If we didn't take any risks in our lives, we wouldn't do anything and we would uh, actually be well far worse off. So it is a balancing act between the optimism that we need to uh, 
take some risks and believe that we'll we'll be able to succeed and overcome them, and when those uh, our beliefs become unrealistic. Uh, it's about finding the right balance between rationality and what is in our natures to be able to do. And that balance is going to vary from individual to individual. But overall, we can't totally ignore the nature of our humanity. But if we just focus on our humanity and ignore our rational understanding of the world, we're not going to make the great achievements, continue to make the great achievements we've made, which have been largely grounded in transcending aspects of our humanity. But at the, at the end of the day, we're still human beings. We still have human needs and aspirations, and we need to be supporting those human needs and aspirations and using our rationality to do that rather than to, uh, uh, to thwart those ambitions. Um, Francis Sopravic has a question for you. How do leaders balance optimism versus pessimism during uh, a crisis? Leaders need to be optimistic. Leaders are risk, have to be risk takers. Uh, so I don't think it's a matter of optimism versus pessimism. It's a matter of optimism versus realism. Having a, a sensible view of what the consequences are going to be and an understanding of what the society values around those consequences. So in the case of COVID, we value preventing immediate preventable deaths. We would feel as a society we'd let ourselves down if we allowed a whole lot of people to die rapidly. Therefore, there's an imperative to do something about that. Doing it in a way that meets the broader needs of the community as well uh, is, is a challenge. And uh, so far, generally so good, I think. Uh, but generally, uh, it's notable that often, uh, even though that they can be successful leaders in adversity, uh, some of the people who are successful at leading us into adversity are not as successful in leading us out of adversity. And, uh, and often political leaders who've been hugely successful in times of war, for example, end up being voted out of office shortly after, after the war ends because they're not seen as the person who's going to uh, shift our mode at, uh, for the different kinds of priorities that are needed uh, as we move towards recovery from these kinds of events. They're very different kinds of challenges, uh, the opti uh, but we need to be optimistic about both, but optimism tempered by uh, whatever rationality we can bring to bear. A question from Ken Parker. How should we get the best long-term planning done and implemented when humans tend to be bad at prioritising for the long term and politicians focus more on the short term and the next election? That's where we have uh, the institutes and uh, and we have groups within a society whose role is to be planning for these longer term things. Uh, as I mentioned, I think uh, people in uh, in defence uh, uh, tend to be very good at planning for these kinds of events because they have to prepare themselves for them. And uh, some of this preparation goes on, uh, in a sense, independent of the uh, of the concerns of, uh, of of politicians, which are very much more focused on the month to month, year to year uh, operations of the society. So it's those institutions of society that actually allow us to provide support for those, that kind of uh, planning. Uh, uh, there probably needs to be much more public understanding of that. Uh, in the defence area, I can understand why some of it's uh, not right in the middle of the public domain because uh, there is a, some them and us issues around defence. But where we can uh, bring everybody together, uh, I think we can. And it's also an important responsibility of uh, NGOs uh, and other organisations 
to at least do the planning as it relates to the issues in which they're concerned. And some of those some of those groups do that incredibly well. The organisation I work for, the Cancer Council of Victoria, has generally done a brilliant job of, of planning for long-term solutions around uh, uh, cancer prevention and uh, other things, for example. Thank you, Ron. A question from Amanda. How do we develop that sense of global cohesion, given that is, that is the level at which we need to act? We would need an emotional connection to it from your presentation. Is that right? Yes, we, 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 need, we need to feel at one with people. And we have many of the tools that we need to feel at one with people. We, we, we now have, uh, you know, if, if, uh, uh, you know, something's not news these days unless you've actually got some pictures to go with it. Uh, so having a news media that actually covers events around the world that talks about the issues, the same kinds of issues of trying to live a decent life and uh, bring up your kids and have enough food on your table and whatever, are ones that are facing all of us uh, to varying degrees. And telling those stories and making those stories real is one of the ways in which we do that. And in the increasingly uh, interrelated world in which we live, I think we're, we're doing it better than we ever have before. Uh, you know, I was read, reading a book that was published in the 50s uh, recently and the way in which they were talking about people other than, uh, than white Westerners uh, was, uh, would not have, it was just stunning in that, not that they were, nasty or anything, they were well-meaning people, but their understanding of the needs, they, they, was, they were talking about uh, uh, African people as if they were a different, a different race, for example, uh, with completely different needs and ambitions to everybody else. And that's when you have those sorts of beliefs, it's very difficult to see yourself as part of the same, uh, the same large group. But the environmental uh, threat, I think, creates huge opportunities to do that because we are all in this together. If the planet overheats and we have uh, the, and becomes unlivable for most of us, people right across the world are going to suffer. So we are facing a common threat. Perhaps we need to be invaded by some uh, some uh, some people from a different uh, different planet or or our solar system somewhere else in the universe uh, to draw us all together. But uh, I think uh, the environmental catastrophe that we, we seem to be facing is the potential force that can really lead to us beginning to see ourselves as a universal humanity. But uh, perhaps I'm just an optimist. Final question then uh, from Ken. Money is a massive weighing factor in decision making. Put another way, the short-term interests of a few greatly distort the decision-making process for sound long-term decisions. That's absolutely true and power, powerful forces are always going to be more influential than powerless forces. Uh, part of the reason that we need to organise and historically for people who've been more disadvantaged that's been through things like unions and various other other forms of organisation are uh, sources of power that aren't belonging to the, those people who are rich and propertyed if you like uh, have been able to compete to some degree uh, but there's always going to be imbalances of, of power and access to power uh, we can act in, minimise those and getting the balance right around people who have uh, through their capacities and resources more to contribute, expecting more of them but allowing them to have somewhat more, I think uh, is, is part of the reality we need to, we need to face. We're not going to uh, end up with some kind of egalitarian society and that's never going to happen but we do need to be able to make sure that those people who have more advantages are at least putting a proportion of that back into supporting those who have, have less. Uh, but that isn't an answer to your question. 
I, I don't think in the modern world we actually have any solution as to uh, uh, as as to the, the fundamental question because uh, power and influence is uh, a fundamental of the way in which things are organised. Thank you, Ron. Um, thank you, those of you that answered our poll question. Do you believe we are doing a good job at predicting and managing adverse events? 10% said yes, 57% said no, and 33% were uh, um, unsure. Uh, look, on that note, it's can, can I just Can I just briefly comment on that, Luan, before we go? Yes. Uh, I, I must say I'm disappointed uh, in, in that uh, result because I personally, as a res partly as a result of putting this presentation together, uh, I've come to believe that we're actually doing an absolutely brilliant job uh, uh, at uh, preventing a whole range of things. Yes, we can continue to do better, but the amount of things we've been able to prevent, the amount of things that we've been able to mitigate the effects of, the extent to which we can have ambitions to be controlling a worldwide epidemic of a new disease in COVID within, a, uh, within say, two years, when it took several centuries to get rid of the plague and, and things like smallpox, as we've made enormous progress. We're doing an absolutely remarkable job, and I think it is part of our short-sightedness and expect unrealistic expectations of perfection that lead us to believe that we're not doing uh, a brilliant job. That said, I'm sure we can do better and we will do better in the future. Thank you, Ron. And, and look, thank you very much for uh, you know, sharing your, your research, your ideas on, on really what is a very complex aspect of, of human behaviour and, and one that really uh, we haven't heard much about. So thank you for making us better informed uh, and hopefully we'll take something away from that and, and maybe we will look at this issue from a, a different lens in the future. And I finally would like to thank the sponsors, the Convergence Science Network sponsors who uh, since 2008 have been making these events possible.